messieurs, mon nom est Hamid Georgiani. En ma qualité de président de ce groupe de réflexion sur le Moyen-Orient, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi de vous accueillir virtuellement et vous souhaiter la bienvenue à la deuxième session de notre programme pour cette année. Last week, we had a former Canadian diplomat, His Excellency John Allen, to talk about state of affairs in the Middle East and provide us with, uh, he provided us with a Canadian perspective as to what was going on in the region and also the accord that was signed uh, in Washington. Today, we have the honor of uh, getting a regional perspective from a distinguished professor, Dr. Mehran Kamrabo from Georgetown University in Qatar. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, his presentation and his perspectives regarding the region. Dr. Kamrabo is a professor of government at Georgetown University in Doha. He's also director of the Iranian Studies Unit at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in Doha, Qatar. Dr. Kamrava is uh, the author of a number of journal articles and books, uh, including uh, the most recent one, which is entitled A Concise History of Revolution. And that was in 2020. In addition, there are a number of other articles and it's very interesting that Professor uh, Kamrava covers a wide range of topics from the uh, insecurity in the Persian Gulf to the great game and also to the modern Middle East. Uh, without any delay, Dr. Kamrava, the microphone is yours and we are delighted to have you today at the uh, second meeting of the Middle East Study Group. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here. Let me start by thanking the Canadian International Council and uh, Hamid Georgiani for uh, giving me the honor of spending this time with you. I'm thrilled and delighted to be here and uh, to share some thoughts and um, more accurately probably share some questions with you. Uh, talk about a tough act to follow. Last week you heard from a seasoned diplomat, uh, distinguished ambassador and uh, for us academics, we have the luxury of pontificating and not necessarily worrying about uh, being, um, being wrong. Uh, so uh, I um, uh, am fully mindful of um, the insight and expertise of uh, uh, last week's talk. And so I'm delighted to be here uh, and to share some thoughts uh, with you. What I wanted to do is to say a couple of things about the emerging and changing regional alliances that are shaping this part of the world where I'm sitting uh, right now. Uh, before I do so, let me just say a couple of things about the shifting center of gravity in the Middle East. Over the last uh, decade and a half, what we've seen is that the diplomatic, political, financial, and economic, and probably military center of gravity in the Middle East has shifted from the traditional capitals of uh, Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, uh, over to places that once we didn't hear about, Doha, Abu Dhabi, and Riyadh. And these countries, the states of the Persian Gulf not only have become consequential players in regional politics and emerging friends in the region, but they've actually become um, influential players. They, to use an overused metaphor, consistently punch above their weight. And since 2011, since the Arab uprisings of the 2011, uh, they have uh, decided to shape destinies of countries like Syria, Yemen, Egypt, and Lebanon, and uh, many other places. Uh, right now, there are, of course, intense competition. So by way of introduction, I think it's important to keep in mind that this region has emerged as the new heart of the Middle East, and that 
the center of gravity in a number of respects has shifted from traditional historical centers in the Levant, in North Africa, uh, onto the Persian Gulf. But as an, as an almost logical extension of this shifting center of gravity, what we see is that alliances have emerged and new alliances are shaping up and the regional geopolitics is taking a shape that we couldn't have imagined five to 10 years ago. And of course, we saw that most starkly and most incredibly in the signing of the peace accord, the so-called Abraham Accord, um, Abrahamic Accord between United Arab Emirates and Bahrain on the one side and Israel on the other. And what we see is that an unofficial alliance that had emerged in a regional pyramid of power, regional emerging strategic alliance of power has now assumed official and formal characteristics. Um, over the last decade or so, we see an emerging regional architecture in which at the tip of the regional power pyramid, we have Israel and Saudi Arabia on the one side, Iran and Turkey on the other side. These are four regional powers with distinctively different ideas of how regional security and regional power politics ought to be uh, structured with Israel and Saudi Arabia endorsing and collaborating with an American engineered regional security structure, whereas Iran and Turkey very differently and under their own unique auspices want to see a region where regional powers uh, themselves become important. And there's a second tier just underneath these regional powers. And again, those second tier countries uh, fall um, in different poles. Uh, just under Israel and Saudi Arabia, we see countries like Jordan, countries like Morocco, countries like Egypt, which used to be on top, but then had difficulties and it became a second tier regional power. On the other side, we see countries like Algeria, uh, Qatar, and Oman, somewhere in between. And what the real competition is between these two top tiers is among the third and final tier of power. And these are states that do not have the capacity to exert central state authority on their territories. These are weaker collapsing states, countries like Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Libya, that have become real areas of contention, real areas of competition between the regional powers that engage in these countries through um, uh, uh, the engaging competition uh, through uh, pr proxy wars and through resort to non-state actors. And everybody does it. Iran does it. Qatar does it. Saudi Arabia has its own uh, proxies and um, uh, so on and so forth. So within that context, we see emerging alliances. And of course, we've seen uh, the official signing of the accord uh, between, um, uh, between uh, UAE and Bahrain on the one side and Israel on the other. Uh, you're probably aware that particularly since 2011, Bahrain has um, uh, started to almost officially, almost formally realign its foreign and security policies with Saudi Arabia. And so Bahrain's joining of the accord um, uh, is, uh, or, or formal recognition of Israel would not have occurred had it not been with the almost explicit, but certainly implicit approval of uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't want to go so far as to say that Bahrain has given up its sovereignty to Saudi Arabia. I will just say that Bahrain very closely coordinates its initiatives with, uh, uh, with Riyadh. So we have that. Of course, we know that the Gulf Cooperation Council right now, the GCC that was 
uh, formed in 1981 currently is on life support because in 2017 there was this major rift that occurred between Qatar on the one side and Bahrain, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and of course joined by Egypt on the other side over a number of factors. We can go into it in the Q&A session but suffice it to say, we can go into the causes of the rift, but suffice it to say that for all intents and purposes, at least practically the Gulf Cooperation Council is uh, non-existent. Although what we're seeing is that recently in the last week, there have been some attempts as we speak, actually the Director General of the GCC is here um, in uh, Doha, he's a Kuwaiti, uh, diplomat and he has just come from Riyadh and uh, there's some chatter in, in, the, in the background that the rift might finally be coming to an end, although I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath. What has emerged in fact is that there's been a very uh, pointed alliance between Qatar and Turkey. And what we see is that a very stark uh, alliance or a very strong and robust alliance has emerged between Qatar and Turkey that is rooted in um, strategic, common strategic interests. It is rooted in uh, um, commercial and trade interests, but it is also rooted in ideological commonalities. Qatar and Turkey see eye to eye. Uh, Turkey, as you know, has as much a, uh, as possible an Islamist government. Qatar um, officially is not Islamist, but the assumption of the government has been that there's, that as political Islam has a future um, in the uh, politics of the Middle East. And as much as we might try and deny that, that of course is, um, uh, is, um, uh, is an emerging uh, uh, factor. So that, of course, is, is uh, important and something for us to keep in mind, this alliance between uh, Turkey and Qatar. And, uh, and uh, this is an alliance that is multidimensional. And despite their major age differences, incidentally, I should add that uh, the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim, and the President of Turkey, Erdogan, get along personally. And that, of course, is important. So we see a Persian Gulf that is now at the heart, at the center of gravity of the region in a whole variety of ways, which I haven't necessarily gotten into, but, but it is an emerging center. But there are also shifting alliances. I will say a couple of things about Iran, but before I talk about Iranian politics, let me say that one of those uh, variables is this much talked about and much discussed uh, um, agreement between Iran and uh, China uh, in relation to the Persian Gulf and China's relationship with the Persian Gulf. We don't know exactly what the um, terms of the agreement are and um, I, I could be completely wrong in my take on it, but let me give you my broad understanding of China's presence here in the Persian Gulf. China is very concerned about its near abroad. When it comes to the Persian Gulf region, China makes no bones about the fact that it is a free rider. In other words, for the time being at least, China is interested in commercial trade and economic interests in the region. It has extremely strong trade relations with United Arab Emirates, even stronger trade relations with Saudi Arabia. It also has strong relations with uh, trade relations with Iran, but it wants security and stability in the Persian Gulf. And it wants that security and stability to be provided by the Americans. It has no intention of stationing troops, having a base, having a military presence that is in any way significant or meaningful 
here in the region. Let the Americans provide the security and stability. And what we will do in the meanwhile is we will continue to trade. They are, of course, quite aware that there needs to be peace and stability in the Persian Gulf region, but they let the Americans worry about that. What the Chinese are concentrating on militarily is their own near abroad, the South China Sea, not necessarily in the Persian Gulf. So my sense is that this agreement between China and Iran that is much hyped and much discussed is not necessarily militarily significant as much as it is economically and commercially significant. Now, 10 years from now, we could be sitting here looking at a very different regional security architecture, but the Americans are not going away from the Persian Gulf. And despite the fact that there's an awful lot of discussion about America's retreat from the Middle East, America's retreat from the Persian Gulf, they're not going away. Military sales are breaking records every week, if not every day. American military sales to the region, as you know, there's this um, sale of um, uh, F-35s. Uh, military to military uh, relationships tend to be quite robust. America's presence in the Persian Gulf is multidimensional. It is, of course, security uh, militarily. It is commercial and economic in the sense that it, uh, just here in Qatar, ExxonMobil has 20 billion, billion with a B, 20 billion dollars worth of investment in hardware, in hardware, in terms of its oil facility. So it is military, it is commercial and economic, it is diplomatic. The American diplomatic presence here is quite firm and quite robust, and it is cultural. The fact that I am sitting here at an American university uh, for the last 13 years, American universities are here. The lingua franca here in places like Qatar and Bahrain and United Arab Emirates and to, to some extent in Kuwait is English. Uh, there is also a strong American cultural content here that is important. The United States is certainly not about to cede military and security ground to China here in the Persian Gulf. It isn't doing it in the South China Sea. It ain't gonna happen here in the Persian Gulf. And so the American uh, military architecture and security architecture would stay uh, robust. So while we don't know the terms of the agreement between China and Iran, uh, certainly there is, um, uh, I, I sincerely doubt that at least in the near future, we will see a military element uh, to it and a military Chinese presence uh, here. Let me end with a couple of question marks about Iran because that is the great unknown. Uh, Iran is on the verge of a leadership transition. Now, the Persian Gulf countries, the Arab countries of the Persian Gulf, went through their leadership transitions uh, over the last decade. Uh, Qatar had a leadership transition in 2013. Saudi Arabia went through a leadership transition uh, right around then between 20, it was actually 2015. Um, um, and and, bah, uh, and uh, um, Oman just went through a leadership transition and uh, the king of uh, Kuwait is uh, quite ill and there's a leadership transition that is about to happen. Iran's dual executive is gonna go through a leadership transition over the next uh, uh, couple of years. First of all, in 2021, there, is a, there are presidential elections uh, come next summer in about six, seven months. In between May and June, uh, May, there are presidential elections in Iran, May of 2021. And make no mistake about it, although there's a leadership and there's the Velayat e someone that Western journalists mistakenly call the supreme leader. The presidency in Iran is quite consequential in deciding Iranian foreign policy. It isn't that Iranian presidency is not consequential. It is quite consequential, and therefore the presidential election is going to have 
consequences for Iran's profile internationally and Iran's relations with uh, the GCC countries. More consequential even is the fact that the so-called supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, is 81. And everybody knows, including Khamenei himself, that he will not uh, be uh, around forever. And of course, if you look at uh, domestic Iranian politics, you see that Khamenei has himself already laid the groundwork for uh, transition. What that transition looks like, we don't know from the outside, but all indications are that inside Iran, a transition has already been decided. Who will take place? We don't know. But certainly there will be a difference in style, even if not in policy. There will be a difference in the relationship between the Revolutionary Guards and the civilian leadership. Right now, Iran's civil military leadership, despite all appearances to the contrary, is very much tilted in favor of civilians. And will that civil military relationship continue with the next leader? And what would that mean about Iran's security policy in Iran's near abroad is, of course, a major question mark. So when it comes to Iran, we have more questions then we have answers because of impending changes on the way. We certainly know here, looking at south of Iran, we know that Saudi Arabia-Israel uh, alliance is only a matter of time, that it has occurred informally. When they sign on the dotted line is only a matter of time. We saw that with the UAE and, uh, uh, and Israel. We saw it with Bahrain and Israel. We know that the Americans are dangling most favorite status uh, in front of Qatar um, to enhance its relations with uh, Israel as well and to uh, 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 heal the rift within the GCC. Will, is that really the October surprise? Is a formal Israeli uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, deal, it, will that be the October surprise? We don't know. I will just end with one thing that I can almost bet on, almost, uh, uh, Hamid, and that is the fact that we will not see um, an open military clash between the United States and Iran uh, uh, in the lead up to the election or after the election, because the one certainty that we saw is that the Iranians not only have um, uh, ballistic missiles, but more importantly, they've shown a willingness to use them, and uh, they, uh, that uh, is a, a deterrence that the Iranians have shown they're willing to use, and as a result, I don't think anybody is willing to um, um, uh, go the extra mile and uh, engage in open military con confrontation. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to try and uh, think through some questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamrabo. It was very interesting assessment. And a uh, couple of things came out of this discussion that um, I have highlighted in my notes. One is this new engineered sort of uh, uh, arrangement that we see. And uh, the other important point was that extent to which different enterprises from America have invested in the region. And the Exxon Mobil was one example. I think there are a few others uh, that also could be mentioned. In that context, the question is, uh, which countries really depend on the Persian Gulf oil at this time? Because I don't think it is USA. It certainly is not the United States. Uh, the biggest uh, importers uh, are now all in Asia. Uh, Japan, China, and, um, and South Korea. Uh, and of course, uh, Europe, but, but the biggest uh, customers of Persian Gulf oil and gas are Asian countries. And one of the, whatever you might say about Trump, uh, the one, one thing going for him, at least one thing we scholars like, uh, we academics like about him, is that he's quite honest. And he sometimes says, probably a lot more than someone in his position ought to say. Uh, last week, he was quite honest. He said, we don't need the Middle East for its oil. Uh, 
we are there because of Israel. And so uh, one thing is, of course, uh, this changing nature of American interests in the region. But the one constant has been America's special relationship with Israel. And um, that relationship will continue to uh, have the United States here. What was interesting, what was quite interesting is that uh, within that uh, special relationship, uh, there are differences of, op of opinion among American policymakers. So some American policymakers say, look, they go to Israel and they say, we are behind you 100% and we will guarantee your security. But we've got other interests also in the Middle East that we've got to take care of. And we saw this in the final months of the Obama administration, when President Obama in a very famous interview said, Saudi Arabia and Iran need to learn to get along, which was quite interesting. Whereas Republican administration, particularly George W. Bush and uh, the Trump administration have gone out of their way to marginalize and isolate Iran rather than uh, encouraging regional actors to engage Iran. And, but, but the United States is staying here, uh, even though oil may not necessarily be uh, main, uh, main interest. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that came out of your um, explanation right now is that uh, the attitude of the United States towards the Middle East, specifically because of Israel. But uh, is it fair to say that now Israel is a de facto superpower? So would Israel still need U.S. support uh, in the region? Well, Israel is, is a, a de jure superpower. It's an actual superpower. And, uh, you know, we see it in its behavior. It knows it. Uh, but, but of course, um, the special relationship between Israel and the United States uh, is organic. It is, uh, the, the relationship is so intimate, so institutionally intertwined, that is not going to change anytime in the near future. So it's not a question of need. It's a question of the special bonds that are multidimensional, ideological, um, uh, institutional, political, uh, demographic that tie these two countries uh, together. And, and of course, uh, bring their uh, policies uh, in, into great consistency with one another. Thank you. So in a way, that relationship is much more stronger than what they had with Iran historically. And uh, Absolutely. probably, right. Absolutely. Now, the, the other question is pertaining to that engineered uh, dynamics that we see. How would you, or what is your view on Soleimani's uh, removal or assassination? Was it something that was desired by all the parties involved or was it really an accident it just happened because he could have been removed many times during the uh, time that he was in the theater uh, in Syria or elsewhere and why that time particularly well there's a number of reasons um, a lot of which we don't really know we can guess at best but first of all let's not forget the ideological zeal not of Trump, but of Trump's uh, deputies. So you have people like Brian Hook, who's now uh, moved from the Iran file, uh, but, but uh, Secretary of State Pompeo is extremely ideologically zealous. And so you have, although someone like Trump might, have, might be a businessman and might be ultimately quite practical, you do have the second stratum of advisors, policymakers, and influential folks in the United States, in the American system, that are quite uh, 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 zealous when it comes to their um, dislike of Iran. Now, so that, that's, and that has guided American policy uh, for some time. It's quite interesting that if you follow, 
uh, foreign minister Zarif's speeches and tweets and um, what he says, he doesn't always criticize Donald Trump. He always goes after Pompeo because he says to Trump, make sure you don't get bamboozled by people like uh, Pompeo and company, which is quite, I think, quite astute on Zarif's part. Uh, but, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, Soleimani, as you know, on that specific trip, was not uh, 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 traveling uh, incognito because he was apparently on, uh, he was exchanging uh, messages with Saudi Arabia through Iran. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, you can argue, has, does Soleimani's removal uh, throw Iran's grand strategy into confusion? And I don't know the answer. I don't know anybody. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. Um, there are different schools of thought on this. Some people say that if you look at what is happening in Iraq, that Iran, uh, Soleimani's removal has really harmed Iranian interests because the different militias in Iraq are fighting and Soleimani's astute diplomacy isn't there to make these guys talk to each other. So that's one school of thought. Another school of thought says, well, you know what, but look at what is happening in Syria, that Iran strategy hasn't quite changed. And the, the replacement to Soleimani comes from, Iran, co comes from managing Iranian uh, militia in Afghanistan. And right now, Iran and the Taliban are, uh, are engaged in negotiations and discussions, which is a new recent development. So, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know the answer to a question. I think there are different schools of thought. I actually didn't think that Soleimani's removal would be that big of a deal because after all, his one individual, the strategy is much deeper. And if you're Khamenei, think about it. Do you want a living hero running around or do you want a dead, uh, a dead martyr, uh, which you can then hold up and say, this guy is, uh, uh, it was killed by the great Satan. So looking at it from real politic, I think Khamenei is sitting there, of course, he's shedding a tear or two in public, but probably he is not as broken as outside we might think he is. Thank you, very interesting observation. The um, question about the agreement, uh, it was discussed in detail last week, but uh, still there are a few areas that uh, we would be much grateful if you could uh, uh, provide your perspectives. One of the uh, questions was pertaining to the site of the embassies. During the uh, discussions, there were no mentioned as to where the embassies would be established for the countries that have signed the uh, agreement. Any speculations at this time or uh, ideas that probably would entice others like Qatar and uh, uh, even perhaps Saudi Arabia to uh, join the agreement? Well, um... Uh, if I may uh, just give you a little bit of uh, background. In 2016, I wrote a book uh, and I started it and ended it uh, by saying, I hope I'm wrong. And I hope this book doesn't come. The, the thesis, I hope, is wrong. And the, the title of the book was The Impossibility of Palestine. And what we see is that uh, now we have this um, utter and complete dismemberment of Palestine. That is, Palestine has been for a long time uh, impossible and it doesn't exist. So the question of where would the embassies be located, I think is really only a matter of time. It may even take a decade or two, but does that really matter? The, the, what has happened is that um, the, uh, the countries have recognized reality. The reality is that 
Israel is there to stay. And there's no such thing as Palestine. At least there is a Palestinian identity, but in terms of an official country, and uh, it doesn't exist. And so I think, you know, where would the embassy be located? Uh, does it really matter? Uh, whether it is in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem, other than symbolism. Uh, and so I think uh, the, um, the fact that it's not mentioned and the fact that it isn't clear is on purpose. One step at a time, it will get them. It'll be ultimately Jerusalem is the capital. You go to Jerusalem today and uh, it's the seat of uh, Israeli power, the seat of government. And so, you know, it, it, it really... It, it, it really doesn't matter. Now, what's interesting is that over the last uh, few years, uh, actually this has been happening since 1979, but one of the things we see is that when the rift occurred, the GCC blockade of Qatar or the, uh, the rift within the GCC occurred in 2017, each of these countries went out of their way they were literally tripping over themselves to enhance their relations with the United States, with a White House that everybody agrees is quite unpredictable and maverick. And so you don't know from one day to the next where you stand with this White House. And so one way to ensure your long-term relationship with a White House in which there's Donald Trump as the president and Jared Kushner as the se senior advisor to the president, is to enhance your relationship with Israel. And how do you enhance your relationship with Israel if you're sitting here in the Persian Gulf, if you're one of these countries? Well, you do it through agreements and trade. And so what we have seen for the past several years is that Israeli companies, some more openly than others, have been quite active in signing agreements, particularly in the cyberspace area, in area of cyberspace security, in decoding, in, in all of these. And so in some ways, Hamid, this agreement, the agreement between um, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain on the one side and Israel on the other, isn't really as earth shatteringly shocking as we might think it is because it only makes official what has been going on for the last several years. And so, you know, uh, it, it isn't as, um, uh, as, as much of a tectonic shift as, as, as we think it is. Now, what is, what is important is that the agreement allows Israel, for example, in a couple of years, in maybe two or three years, to then have uh, security agreements with United Arab Emirates. There's already discussion that this Yemeni island, Socotra, uh, which is strategically quite important and the UAE has had designs on, uh, might turn into a base for UAE and Israel. What you might see is Israeli military presence in the Persian Gulf. Now that then, but that would be in a, in a couple of years. So once, uh, you take the agreement to its logical extension, you see that there are major geostrategic shifts that will be important in a couple of years. Thank you. A very interesting analysis. Now, if the political Islam continues to function within the region, uh, would it be also considered as a deterrent for um, even China or the uh, Russia is, uh, is it still uh, the type of uh, uh, tool that people are looking at? You know, uh, there's a couple of things about political Islam. Uh, we can have an entire session on political Islam. But uh, everybody, the West has decided that Islam should not be involved in politics in the Middle East. And that if there's political Islam, it will not go the way of uh, Christianity. And so the same way that you have Christian Democrats in Germany and uh, in, across Europe, 
you won't necessarily have Muslim Democrats. And so quite short-sightedly, the West and local political elites here in the Middle East have decided that there is no room politically for Islam and that engaging it is only, um, is only uh, uh, fraught. And so that assumption has turned Islam radical, it has turned it politically oppositional, and it has made Islam an inherently conflictual and conflict-ridden political dynamic and political force. Now, that, so, so that is something to keep in mind. Political Islam, at least as far as local political elites are concerned, and as far as Western political elites are concerned, should be kept out of politics. And so they would much rather have a Sisi in power in a place like Egypt than have a Morsi in, in power in Egypt. Uh, now, some professor, some academic would come and say, wait a minute, give Islam a chance to politically discredit itself. Give Islam a chance politically to come to power and then be, uh, uh, let it get out of power through the ballot box rather than through, uh, uh, through the barrel of a gun. But that's a separate discussion. Now, what we also see is that countries like China and Russia have their own supposed problem with political Islam. But these local political elites across the Middle East, whether it is secular uh, Sisi in Egypt or the secular, ostensibly secular monarchs here in the Persian Gulf or the theocracy in Tehran, they of course turn a blind eye to China's treatment uh, of its Muslim minority and to Russia's treatment of the Chechens and uh, what, is, what happened in Chechnya. And what this tells us is that strategic real politic and strategic considerations trump solidarities of religion and religious sensibilities. And so I, I don't see anyone in the Iranian government talking about the Indian treatment of Kashmir never mind the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs, because the Iranians need friends wherever they can get them, whether it's the Indians, uh, the, some uh, pseudo-fascist group like the BJP, uh, or if it's the Chinese, whoever it is, the Iranians have no friends. They need them where they can get them. And the same thing with the Saudis, the same thing with the, uh, uh, with the Emiratis, Lataris, and so on and so forth. So in that context, uh, how do you see the future of um, uh, current administration in Iran in the over next few years? Well, one thing uh, uh, that we saw, Ro the current administration of Rouhani has had manifold failures in economics. It's laissez-faire economics has, has not worked um, and it has manifold failures. Politically, however, there's been a very interesting development in Iran over the last few years. And that is the fact that Rouhani, uh, probably because of his own background within the system, having come from within the heart of the Islamic Republic system, has been able to put together a consensus of a very fractious political system in which the revolutionary guards with their own interests and their own strong corporate identity, the so-called conservatives or the principalists with their own interests and their own identity, the supreme leader with his own unique interests and identity. All of these groups have come together and agreed to the nuclear agreement. Rouhani, this was his single most successful uh, political initiative in Iran. The fact that he could bring everybody to agree on the nuclear agreement. 
And of course, everyone denied that they were part of the agreement. But if, the, if Khamenei hadn't given his blessing, Iran would have never signed up to the nuclear agreement. The question that you raise, Hamid, is quite important. How do you see the political administration in Tehran over the next few years? Would the next president be able to put together such a coalition of diverse and disparate political forces? Or is he going to be a polarizing factor like Ahmadinejad, that the majlis, the parliament couldn't stand, Khamenei couldn't stand, the judiciary couldn't stand. So that I think is quite important. That's one question that I think is important for us to look. And the other question that is quite important to keep in mind is that Iran is in a very steady, but a very important, but hard to notice process of transition when it comes to generation. The old generation of revolutionaries is dying off one after another. And going, looking, sitting here in five years looking at Iran, who is going to be in charge? What is that generation? Ahmadinejad was the first president of the Islamic Republic not to have had personal contacts with Khomeini. And I think we can bet that the next president and his inner circle will also not have had any personal contact, knowledge, relationship with Khamenei or, or with Khomeini or, and his generation. And I think that is something quite important for us to, uh, to pay attention. Okay. Uh, th uh, thanks. And, but within the context of what you actually presented, uh, you had talked about that civilian aspects of the army. How would that sector fit into this equation? Uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question, which I, I quite frankly don't know. Um, what will be the position of the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards? And I don't know if anybody can, can really uh, tell you. Now, the IRGC has always had um, a very strong corporate identity. It has had, um, it has, it, as we know, it's an economic empire. And it is in many ways like the PLA, People's Liberation Army of China. It is engaged in multiple uh, uh, endeavors that go beyond security and, uh, and economic needs. What we have seen is that many uh, IRGC uh, commanders retire and go into the political system. Many of them go in business. Many of them are appointed as governors, are appointed as heads of uh, foundations, different arms of the bureaucracy. But many of them also become members of parliament. Uh, the IRGC is very robustly represented in the current 11th uh, parliament. That, has, that came into uh, being uh, last February. So uh, I sincerely doubt if we will see uh, someone from the military taking over uh, in Iran, but I think what we will see is going the way of Egypt, where military generals take off their uniform, where they don't wear uh, ties in Iran, uh, where civilian, um, uh, garb and uh, and enter uh, enter politics. I have a question regarding this whole situation now and uh, the uh, political history since World War One. The book that you have written uh, is there any continuity? Are there any factors uh, that were very significant during that period? and are being replayed now? That's, a, that, that's an excellent question. And uh, if I ever uh, revise that book, I will mention this. So right now, uh, here in the Persian Gulf, and for those of you 
who are not necessarily familiar with the rhythm of life here in the Persian Gulf. We're in the midst of a sectarian wave where if in the 1980s, beginning in the 1980s, people sought shelter in the comfort of religion and used religion as a source of political expression, as a source of identity. By the time you come into the 2000s, and particularly after the Arab Spring uprisings of 2010, what we see is a wave of sectarianism, that political Islam was taken to its extreme extreme. So if you were Sunni, you became even more Sunni. And if you were Shia, you became even more Shia. So your religious identity was taken to an extreme. Now, what is happening isn't so much a sectarianization, whereas it is a re-sectarianization. In fact, it was in the 1920s. I'm not one of those people who blames the problems of the Middle East on the West. But what we see in the 1920s is that the British and the French came as the Ottoman Empire was on its last breaths. And they divided people along sectarian lines. And as a result, we have that political fiasco in Lebanon. And so they, divide, they define people and they define nations based on sectarian lines. And that sectarian sensibility that became politicized back in the 1920s always remained as a, as a subtle, under the surface source of identity. And every once in a while it becomes reawakened. And after 2010, we see it. We see currently today this polarization between the Sunnis and the Shia that is really at its core a strategic competition between two aspiring regional powers of Iran and Saudi Arabia. And they claim the mantle of the leadership of the Shia world, Iran, and the Sunni world, Saudi Arabia. And so that strategic competition has assumed sectarian dimension. So what we are seeing is this continuity, leftover, carryover, from the 1920s. One thing that I think is also important to mention is when ISIS or Islamic State came about and it was uh, trying to uh, create a new caliphate in the Middle East, people said the assumption was that the boundaries that were drawn in the 1920s are going to be erased. And I think what we have seen is that in the last century, national identity and nation-specific, country-specific nationalism, Iraqi nationalism, Saudi nationalism, Jordanian nationalism, Syrian nationalism, have become so strong that boundaries, borders, are not about to be uh, they're not about to disappear anytime in the near future. And we will continue to see them. So those boundaries that were drawn by uh, colonial officers, those straight lines on a map that in turn became national uh, borders, those are here to stay. Uh, in that context, do you see the possibility of a uh, federal state of the Middle East where all these artificial states would join together and have a federal state uh, working in collaboration with Israel? I don't, I don't. I, uh, in fact, uh, when uh, the European Union was taking shape as we know it, I mean, as you know, of course, it's been evolving uh, for a number of decades. But in the 1980s and in the 1990s, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was an awful lot of excitement that the world was moving into regional blocks and that regionalization was the new order of the globe and that we would see things like NAFTA, we would see things like um, 
European Union, we would see ASEAN, we would see Latin American Free Trade Agreement, we see Mercosur, we see um, ECOWAS. Well, you know what? Then um, Boris Johnson happened, and Donald Trump happened, and COVID happened. And what we see is a retrenchment, and Brexit happened, by the way. We see a retrenchment of people into their national identities, to their country-specific national identities. And this happened in places where we thought um, uh, you would have uh, this kind of dissipation of national identity. But for goodness sake, even in Europe, you have the uh, rise of the right. Even in France, you have someone like Mary Le Pen, who is now become respectable. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, across Europe, you have the rise of nationalist and ultra-nationalist forces. You certainly aren't going to see this in a place where historically the state is a much more recent creation. In the Middle East that has, since the 1950s, been gripped in the fervor of nationalism. And I think we are having some technical uh, difficulties from uh, from Doha. Can you still hear us, Professor Kamrava? I think there was a, uh, your system froze for a minute. Ah, I think, uh, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Yeah. I tell you, I, I think it was Mary Le Pen uh, who sent a virus. <laughs> so um, th that was a good point that you're saying that uh, notwithstanding COVID, uh, which requires a universal response, we see that this fragmentation uh, becoming more and more visible that people think that they can do it on their own. And um, um, which is an interesting topic because going back yesterday, listening to some of the people talking at the UN uh, general meeting, it seems everyone, especially the Chinese, were very much suggesting that people have to work together. And um, now, uh, as you said, we see the reverse of that happening. I think your uh, line is uh, broken again and we can't, we can't see you. There are a couple of questions, and um, I was I'm going to ask we you. We are frozen. Yeah, it, you, again, we lost you. I'm just going to ask you a few more questions, and then the floor would be yours to uh, uh, basically close the session with some final remarks. There were questions pertaining to the future of Iran, which I think you have very eloquently answered. But uh, there is one that says, how do you see the rise of the nationalism in Iran? That's one question. And the second question, I'm going to combine them. Uh, the second question, although different, uh, it's uh, referring to the Palestinian homeland. And the question is, is it all but finished or is there still hope for that discussion? Yeah, uh, let me start with the second one. Uh, nations don't go away, uh, countries go away. So there's a Tibetan identity, but there's no Tibet. There will always be a Palestinian identity, but there won't be a Palestine as a um, sovereign state. And anyone who says that, I invite them to go to the region and see the so-called two-state solution at work. Anyone who still has this illusion that the two-state solution is a, is a possibility. I, ought to go and see the geography of the place uh, firsthand. So na nations don't go away, national identities. And so there will always be a Palest Palestinian uh, identity, but whether or not we will have a country as Palestine, that I, uh, I cannot fathom, uh, given the reality of the way things exist. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, the, the question of nationalism in Iran. Uh, 
all of these countries in the Middle East are gripped with nationalism. The problem that Iran has is that there are, because of this uh, Islamic Republic, because of its uh, often arbitrary repression of uh, 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 and arbitrary restrictions, so many Iranians, particularly those outside, are fed up with this government that they tend to put their personal or financial interests above national interest. So I think that question about nationalism in Iran is a really important one. And I don't have an answer to it. Because oftentimes what we see is that people are willing to become, I don't want to say lackeys, but people are willing to become supported by Iran's uh, self-declared enemies openly declared enemies for their own interests and put their national interest secondary uh, to their ideological interest. And we see this, this happens with emigre communities everywhere. It happened with Cubans in uh, Florida. It's happening, at, but it, uh, it's happening everywhere. I, before coming to Doha, I lived in Los Angeles and intimately familiar with the uh, emigre community. So when you ask about nationalism in Iran, I think a lot of it depends on who you're talking about. Are you talking about people who are being supported by the Saudis? Are you talking about people who put their own interests um, uh, and, and their, these media personalities uh, uh, who put their own interests behind uh, above and beyond national interest? Or are you talking about those people who um, go to prison in Iran, uh, risk political repression because they tell the government, you are harming Iran's national interest? And I think that's, that's a question that is very difficult to answer. We cannot quantify it. We cannot understand it. And so that's a question probably we can come back to at some point in the, in the future. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kamdravar. Now the uh, mic is yours for your closing remarks. If you have any other uh, comments or uh, suggestions, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Before internet cuts off again, uh, let me thank uh, the uh, Canadian International Council and uh, my friend Hamid Georgiani again for this opportunity to be with you. Anyone who tells you um, they know exactly what's going to happen in the Middle East next year uh, or five or 10 years from now, I would take with a grain of salt. We have far more questions than we have answers. But certainly the one thing that is for certain is that there are multiple layers of complexity. There are multiple factors at work that make the social sciences in general, and Middle East politics in particular, especially complex and difficult to decipher and understand. And I think oftentimes what we need to keep in mind is that what appears to be certain on the surface, there are multiple layers of complexity underneath it that we may not necessarily see. So with that, uh, I thank you for your indulgence. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, but again, I'm honored to have been here and to have shared uh, the past hour with you. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamra. It's uh, our pleasure that we had you. It is our honor uh, to be able to discuss this important topic with you. You provided us with a perspective which is very much uh, close to the area, as you said, where you sit, and um, we appreciate that. Uh, before closing, I would like to thank once again uh, Canadian International Council for providing us with the opportunity, especially using the platform, and also the technical support that we always get uh, from our uh, Director of Communication, Mr. Samuel Amoua, and others who are behind the scene helping us with the uh, event that we had uh, so far. Uh, next event for the Middle East Study Group will be in October, and it would be continuation uh, of the discussions that we have had with the ambassador and with you, Mehran, and it would be regarding Lebanon. 
what is happening in Lebanon. And uh, we will discuss that in October. And I invite everyone to join us. The announcement will be soon uh, distributed. And again, I would like to close with a special thanks to Professor Mehran Kamrabo from Georgetown University in Qatar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. We end.